All right. Um, so this meetup is on the Couchbase and uh, on the containers and Kubernetes. So the company we have been uh, considered as a thought leader for containers because uh, as a NoSQL database, we have been putting a lot of effort on the uh, making Couchbase run on the containers. And now we have uh, invested a lot of uh, our time basically on making the Couchbase work on the Kubernetes. Right. So this meetup is basically talking about the integration we have built on the Kubernetes. Right. So I'm going to kick it off. So I have two presenters. Uh, today we have uh, Anirudh from Google. He's a software engineer. And I have Mike, who's our, uh, he's in Couchbase. He's the lead engineer for the Kubernetes on, the, on Couchbase. So first few slides, and again, uh, some of you are new to the Couchbase. So I'm going to talk, talk about the Couchbase data platform. Um, so the Couchbase data platform consists of like uh, te different technologies, right? So we started with key value store. We became a document store. We added support for JSON document, right? And then we uh, we ex started expanding our data platform capabilities. So we have in the beginning key value store, document store. We added query, which is a SQL like query language. So if you're coming from RDBMS, you are uh, so if, if, you, if you have been working on a SQL SQL all your life, so now you can come bring that knowledge or skill set to Couchbase, right? So you can use uh, Nickel, which is a SQL like query language, to work on the Couchbase. So which will be which is a JSON uh, document store, right? So we have, uh, as I said, like we have been adding our more and more technologies to the Couchbase data platform. Uh, in 5.0, we introduce full text search capability. Uh, we are adding in 5.5, which is coming out. Um, we have a beta version of 5.5 out. Uh, we are adding eventing, analytics, right? And also we have the we are the only NoSQL database to have mobile solution, right? So if you have if you are a mobile developer. Uh, if you want to have Couchbase Lite, which is a NoSQL database running on the edge devices like I iPhone or Android devices, you can use Couchbase Lite, which, uh, ha which will run on your devices. We have a synchronization technology which will synchronize your data back to the cloud, which is Couchbase Server. Right? So this is, I just want to spend a few minutes there. So again, uh, so we have a we have SDKs, uh, uh, which are the smart, smart clients, the smart SDKs, which and knows the uh, how to talk to the Couchbase server. They are cl uh, cluster aware, like topology aware. Uh, so as I said, like full stack, full stack security. Uh, so containers in the cloud, cloud deployment. I'll talk a little bit more on the container stuff. So, <clears throat> so what are we doing with the containers? Right. So in some sense, like uh, it goes back in 2013 when even Docker was way early in the you know point four version, right? Our co-founder of the company, uh, Dustin Sailing, who is one of the highest contributor to the, contributor to the Memcached team, he even started experimenting running Couchbase on the containers back in 2013. Right. Um, so, so it's a kind of a, it goes back. Like we have been experimenting on the containers in 2015 when we saw a huge uh, growth on the Docker. Like, you know, there was initially it was like developers who were trying to uh, run uh, on the cont containers, and we wanted to be there. Right. So. But then we saw a lot of customers also wanted to run small workloads on the containers. Um, so at that time, what we did is like in 2016, um, we, we production certified running Couchbase, which is a NoSQL database on the containers. Right? Uh, when I say production certified, uh, we in fact built a new system framework, which is a containerized framework to run all our system testing on containers for Couchbase. Right? So from, from 2016, when we released 4.5, we have been publishing Couchbase image to Docker Hub. Every major, minor, and maintenance release, you'll see the Couchbase images up on the Docker Hub, which is uh, Ubuntu-based. And also, we have been publishing to the Red Hat catalog, uh, the access.redhat.com, which is the REL-based uh, container image. Right? So also, we have a page on our website, which is couchbase.com slash containers. And you'll see there is a, uh, like many, many blogs and, and videos we have published on how to run Couchbase on the containers. Right? What are the best practices? What are the uh, techno? Uh, how to monitor it? Like bunch of bunch of those blogs are focused on that. Also, there is a best practices guide which talks about how to run Couchbase on the containers. What are the best practices and stuff? Right. So we has as I said, like we have Docker. Uh, we also work with Mesosphere. We also work with the Red Hat OpenShift. Right. <clears throat> so this slide just to uh, showcase like uh, why Couchbase is a good fit for containers. And again, I'm not trying. Um, I'm not uh, covering a lot of things about containers, which is a shared nothing architecture, masterless, memory centric, memory centric architecture. But the one of the feature which kind of uh, uh, stands out is the multi-dimension scaling. So when you look at the microservice architecture, what it gives you is like you're breaking the monolithic application to a smaller services, right? So we can you get a lot of flexibility 
you can scale them independently so so that's the same idea where what we applied here is in in multi dimension scaling is like we break the whole workload the database workload into separate services right so we have separate services for data for index for query uh, we are adding analytics we are adding eventing all of that will be a services which run on the data platform right um, what it gives you this flexibility, right? So if you want to deploy your Couchbase cluster, um, you can pick uh, different sizes of containers. I can have a size of like you no know, four core, uh, four GB RAM container size for data, right? I can scale them like that. And for my index and uh, query, I need more CPUs. I can have eight cores and four gigs memory of uh, for the index and query, right? So we can basically have different hardware for your cluster, right? So it gives you a full flex, uh, flexibility in terms of picking the hardware resources for your deployment. Right. Sorry, any questions or? Okay. So um, again, this is more on the coach base on containers. Uh, 20, uh, 2016, 2017, there were many. Um, so we knew that containers are like obviously in the beginning at least uh, were a good fit for stateless applications, right? So. You lose containers, like they are lightweight, they are bound to die. So when you lose a container, you start another container in, in, in place of that because it's stateless. Um, so all you need is like uh, same capacity, right? Because uh, in, in, uh, you can't do that for database, right? Because when you lose uh, a container for which is running a database, you would basically lose the data, right? So that kind of was the hint, uh, kind of problem in the beginning. And, and Mike is going to talk more on the stateful application, which is what Kubernetes introduced, right? So along with that, so there is also um, we need containers needs an orchestration technology. In 2016 to 2017, there were different flavors of container orchestration technologies. I'm going to talk a little bit on that. So, so each of these vendors you see here, like Docker, CoreOS, uh, Red Hat, uh, AWS, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Azure, each of them had their own uh, their own proprietary container orchestration technology, right? Like uh, Docker has Swarm, Tech CoreOS Core had Tectonix. What changed in 2017, like at least 2017, was that like, uh, Kubernetes was uh, kind of came came as a winner across all the container or container orchestration, right? So you see that like now every of these all these vendors have adopted Kubernetes. Uh, we saw the announcement from Docker, from AWS, from uh, Microsoft Azure. Each of them are uh, are going to support Kubernetes as a native service on their platform, right? Why it's important for us? Because now if we have a native integration with Kubernetes, you can run on any of these uh, cloud platforms. Okay. Again, just one slide on why Kubernetes, right? So it's open source, right? Um, it's backed by giants. Like there are big companies like Red Hat, um, Google, for example, uh, has been biggest contributor. The, it, Kubernetes was born from uh, Google. Microsoft, uh, uh, Core, I think CoreOS, uh, there are many companies who are actually uh, supporting the, the uh, open source Kubernetes project, right? It's one of the highest, fastest growing open source project. There are 15,000 contributors actively working on adding new extensions, new tools for Kubernetes, right? So it's, it's one of the popular, uh, the open source project. And as I, uh, I explained earlier, so it's supported in all the clouds, right? So it's supported on the uh, AWS. If I want to deploy a Couchbase operator on, the, uh, on AWS, I can, uh, so they have EKS, the Elastic Kubernetes Service, which is in preview right now, uh, but it will be, it supports the uh, open source Kubernetes, right? So essentially, it's like if I want to deploy your, if you build a Kubernetes application, you can deploy in any of these clouds, right? In terms of partnership also, it is enabling a lot of partnership because now, uh, because like what Kubernetes provides you is like infrastructure agnostics, right? So any of this, any of these partners who supports Kubernetes, now we can basically build partnership with this. Uh, for example, the partners like Red Hat, uh, Mesosphere, uh, IBM Bluemix, any of these partners will become, uh, you know, we can have a big, uh, you know, great partnership with them. Right. In terms of adoption, if you look at the Google Analytics, it will show you that uh, the Kubernetes adoption has been like you know, skyrocketing in some sense. Right. So there's a lot of enterprise customers are um, when they're thinking about microservice architecture. Uh, when they think about microservices, they, the way they productize it is by using the Kubernetes itself now. So there's a lot of hype and a lot of enterprise customers are evaluating at this point. Right? So now before I, uh, so here uh, we want to cover a little bit about basics of Kubernetes and this is where I would call Anirudh here. So he's going to cover like what's the, like again, give a context on the Kubernetes, like how it was born, what are the basics and then uh, Mike will talk about like the stateful sets and the, the operator we have built. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I am Anirudh. I am a software engineer on the Kubernetes team and on GKE. So I've uh, been on the team for about 
two years, uh, I worked on stateful workloads, including like the stateful set abstraction, which was the first one that came about. And then uh, after that, I started this community, which is SIG Big Data, which is the open source community where we get together and talk about uh, big data and machine learning and things like that. Uh, some of, and one of the things I did there was like Apache Spark um, and native integration of Kubernetes with that. And I'm also a Spark committer. So um, yeah, I'm here to introduce like why we think of like the way Google thinks of Kubernetes and where we see this evolving as time goes on. So uh, starting with like Kubernetes has uh, become the Linux of the cloud. And I think Anil mentioned this in a slide, like uh, there's all different vendors that are using this. It's become sort of the new operating system, uh, so to speak. And this is a quote by the executive director of the Linux Foundation saying, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous. People are running it on their laptops, in private clouds, and in every major public cloud provider there is. Uh, yeah, so why did Google even come up with this whole idea? It's like, show of hands, how many people here have heard of Kubernetes? Okay, everyone has. And how many of you have used it? Okay, awesome. Yeah, uh, a year ago, the same question refreshed a whole different response. So it's, it's good to see. Um, so yeah, this started off like many, many years ago, I think like 10 plus years ago at Google where this cluster orchestrator named Borg was born. Borg, there's a paper published about this as well. It's the container manager that Google uses internally. And, and it was found that it, it is really good in terms of scaling the number of applications that we have deployed and not having to scale the SRE team with that. So, uh, and the benefits of containers were like realized over time and like it's gone through many phases and you know, iterated on it to where it is today. And at some point, I think uh, around 2014, we started to take the best parts of that uh, whole Borg solution and started to work, like uh, started to come up with this whole new solution in open source built from uh, scratch uh, called Kubernetes. So that's kind of where the roots belong. So it's a whole bunch of people that worked on Borg that came together uh, to create Kubernetes. Uh, what does Kubernetes do? It's container-centric infrastructure. It gives you all the tools that you need to manage and productionize container-centric applications. And uh, when I say manage and productionize, I mean uh, all of the things that are listed here. There's scheduling, where do I put my workload? There is life cycle and health, which is, you know, how, how do I know how well my container is doing and how do I ensure that they're running irrespective of what happens? You know, nodes go down, hardware fails and so on. Uh, the scaling, where I want to scale the workload that I have up and down, especially uh, for stateless stuff, that's where we started with Kubernetes. Um, naming and discovery, where one container needs to talk to the other and then you want to make sure that they have a stable way of communicating with each other, with each other because containers, as we know, are kind of like these ephemeral entities, right? Uh, then there's load balancing and storage and so on. Storage especially is like important because in this world of containers moving between machines, you cannot expect that the storage would remain attached to a particular node anymore. So you, you need abstractions within Kubernetes itself, which ensure that your storage moves with your container, so you have access to it. Um, so yeah, all of these things uh, are kind of things that Kubernetes provides either directly or through a plug-in mechanism. Any questions? Yeah, so this is the, the high-level overview of Kubernetes. So the user interacts with uh, Kubernetes through the API, right? The CLI uses the API, the UI uses the API, everything uses the API. One of the key things that was uh, different in Kubernetes was there is no public and private API. So pretty much everything that's used uh, by the system, the user also has access to. So it's not using some special API for the nodes to talk to the master and so on. And then uh, the master is uh, in, in this diagram for simplicity is just one uh, machine, but you could actually have more than one. So in, in an HA configuration, you could have like up to, okay, you could have three masters and then have like active passive type of um, setup. So the master contains like the API server, which is basically the component that receives your API calls and decides what to do about them. HCD is sort of like Zookeeper, if you've uh, dealt with Zookeeper before, it's for config management and then there is uh, controllers, we'll, we'll get to that. And then each of the 
do your workloads, which you're scheduling, actually run on nodes. Nodes are just, um, this is the Kubernetes concept of a node, which, which is different from uh, the Couchbase concept of it. Uh, a no node is just a machine, a VM, anything that's running this node agent called a kubelet. The kubelet's going to look at the node, compute a bunch of metrics, and then be like, I can run workloads of size X or you know, publish a bunch of things, and the master can then decide where to place your workload. And, and then, of course, your nodes are the ones that are actually running the containers in the end. So uh, the concept of a pod here, a pod is, so when I said we schedule containers, that wasn't completely true, because we actually schedule groups of containers. And this could be like one or more container. Typically, it's one. But we also see lots of people having more than one container that are co-scheduled. And I'll talk about this example, which uh, kind of uh, make sense in that scenario. So in this example, right, like there's two containers. There's a file puller and the web server. The file puller is kind of pulling from some external repository maybe and then making a static website available on a volume and then the web server is serving it out. So in this case, it, it does not make sense to run one without the other and the shared storage between them is actually useful. So in that case, uh, the pod that we are referring to will actually contain two containers. So Pod's just a group of containers, one or more. And it's it's bound to a node. So if your node goes down, your node goes away, your pod goes away forever. So this is like the basic atomic unit of scheduling. Any questions? Okay. Um, so like I mentioned, pods go away when the node goes away. And that's not desirable behavior, right? Like when, when you have a workload that's like a, a web server and one of them goes away when it was serving traffic, you have less, um, you know, less replicas to serve the same traffic. So that's not a desirable scenario. So what you have is control loops. And these control loops, the implementation in Kubernetes is a, is a controller, a Kubernetes controller. So they're really simple. All they do is look at the current state, look at how many pods are running, for example, or it could be any other object in the system for that matter. So look at the current state, look at the desired state, compare them, and do whatever is necessary to reconcile these two. So that, that's basically all it does. Uh, so because people don't typically create pods which go away and are ephemeral, we uh, created four built-in APIs. There's actually five, but four that are important. So there's deployment, which is uh, you would typically say, hey, run four copies of my app for me. And the deployment will spin up four. And then you can see in this diagram on the right, uh, it checks with the API, hey, how many are running? And the API returns, hey, only three of them are running. And that's not my desired state. So there's a difference of one. So it's going to go and say, run another pod, another replica. That's probably going to end up on a different node, but it doesn't care. Right? So all it does is this. Um, then there's daemon set. If you want to run something as a daemon, which is basically, I want to run something on every node of my cluster. I don't want more than one on each uh, on any node, but may maybe I have uh, an example of this is like uh, NVIDIA drivers. If I want to install them on each node, I would put them in a daemon set because they would go, they would access some shared paths, whatever, and install the driver for me. But it doesn't make sense for me to put like more than one on each node in, right? Um, then there's stateful set. So this was uh, one of the early things that I worked on. Uh, stateful set is sort of, uh, you could say it's a deployment on steroids because it has a few additional properties. In addition to saying, here, run five copies of my app. You have five copies that are named that have a specific DNS name and that have storage that attach to them. So if they go back down, they'll reattach with the same storage and be available again. Right? So they're, they're meant for running stateful workloads and uh, they're kind of very generic. Like you, you could imagine, uh, I think people have uh, run all sorts of databases with them and so on. And I think. Uh, Mike is going to talk more about like what didn't work with that, right? Uh, and then there's jobs. Jobs are like it's going to launch a bunch of pods for you, but each of them will complete. Like they're going to run to completion. Maybe it's like a map reduce, and you have five mappers that spin up, and then all of them eventually complete, right? So that's these are the four main APIs that we provided for people to, you know, shoehorn their apps into one of these or use more than one of these. Uh, but the problem is you cannot always shoehorn everything into these. And oftentimes, 
you don't want to because the exp- like there's a certain way to express things if you're trying to structure if you're writing an application that has five different components um, writing them in terms of stateful set and daemon set and deployment doesn't quite give you the same level of flexibility as expressing it in a higher level uh, representation so that's one thing you want to represent it better and secondly sometimes the functionality that i described is just not sufficient to run that particular application and for things like this that off late we've been focusing more on operators so operators are nothing but a custom api and this is not compiled into kubernetes in any way you create the custom api at runtime and then you say like in the example on the right there is uh, this api is called my app cluster and it has a notion of type 1 replicas and type 2 replicas which are not tied to anything else like kubernetes has no idea a priori what those even mean so it lets you create this custom api and you write a custom controller and we're making advances to make that easier to write the custom controller is going to look at this api and then decide what to do so in this case uh, you can see it's it's querying for how many type 1 that's your custom controller doing this reconcile so what this gives us is uh, with a kubernetes style api you can generate clients you can do a lot of things that we do within kubernetes uh, and you get all of that for free including like api versioning validation um, you know upgrades you know you want to change the storage underlying storage in your api and so on all of that comes for free it's composable because you can have one operator create another um, and so on so you can have an entire hierarchy where maybe i deploy uh, spark and i want driver ha and it deploys zookeeper for me underneath and i don't i don't have to do so much work right and and it's declarative in that i'm expressing in this new dsl where i don't have to shoehorn it into what replica set am i using and so on so this is kind of the pattern where we see the community shifting and we're kind of making all of these things easier building kubernetes style apis as well as custom controllers uh, so this, this is like an example this is a spark operator that we built you can see that on the on the right it has specific fields which would make sense only to spark like spec dot driver and the uh, main application file main class etc all of these things just make sense in spark land and what it also gave us is we just generated a client called spark ctl which is just like kube control kube ctl and that already does a bunch of things like it can handle these jobs you can have custom logic for how you know how far has my job proceeded can i go kill it and so on which would be harder from like the kube control level because you're not dealing with pods anymore you're dealing with spark applications uh, questions yes uh, now I will hand off to Sorry. okay yeah. he'll talk more about operators in the context of questions. yeah okay so um, one question that I get asked a lot is why did we not use stateful sets um, and the reason we didn't use stateful sets is basically uh, because Kubernetes, um, really what it tries to do with all their controllers is it tries to really just spin up pods. Um, and I know that, that sounds kind of simplistic. It does, like, it does tons of awesome things uh, that really help for a vast majority of applications. But there are some applications that uh, they really just, um, they, they need a little bit more. Um, and so uh, the reason, for example, is like, let's just take Couchbase, for example. Let's say we, we wrote up a stateful set, a uh, YAML file, we pushed it into Kubernetes. We said we wanted a four-node cluster. Uh, Kubernetes will go, and it will deploy Couchbase on all four of those pods. But the problem is, is that all four of the Couchbase servers are going to be uninitialized, and they're not going to know about each other. Um, and so stateful sets, uh, they, they really just try to kind of stay in that boundary, which I think is the right decision to do, um, because it would be bloating to, to add all kinds of extra hooks uh, into those types of things. Um, but one of the really great things about operators, what it allows you to do is really customize uh, exactly what your application needs so that you can encode all the things that uh, uh, an SRE or somebody managing the cluster would actually do. And so uh, instead of just spinning up the pods, what we can actually do is once they come up, we can pick one and we can say, we're going to initialize this pod. And then we can go to the other three and we can say, we're going to join these into the cluster. Um, if we want to edit uh, configuration parameters that are specific to just Couchbase, uh, we, can, uh, we can actually have our controller 
know about those parameters and actually make those changes to the cluster. Um, and then even in, in, um, in more heavy examples, so when Couchbase has a failover mechanism, where if a node crashes, we're able to, um, since we have replicas, we can make sure that you don't lose any data, uh, and then you can add nodes back into the cluster. In the stateful set model, the node would just go down, it would come back up, uh, and then it wouldn't be added back into the cluster. If we could add it back, uh, then we'd have this other problem of, if you ever use Couchbase, you have to warm up your data. And if you have a lot of data, that can take 20 minutes, and you don't want to have 20 minutes of downtime. So we can actually go in and we can encode, actually, you know, when a node goes down, we're going to restart it, but first let's run a failover, and then when the node comes back up, let's wait for it to warm up. And once it's warmed up, let's join it back into the cluster with the data that it has. Uh, and so this is really where the power of operators is, is if you have applications that, are, that have very heavy management tasks, um, you, can, you can encode all of those complex things into the controller um, to, to, to make sure that your applications are always running properly. Okay, so the way... All right, so the way um, that these uh, operators are built uh, is through what's called a CRD, which is a custom resource definition, um, and a controller. And so our controller is, in a lot of ways, exactly the same the way that it's set up and works as a stateful set or any of the other things. All the entry points are the same because Kubernetes is really extensible. Um, and they even have, um, if you ever build one of these, they even have code generation uh, modules that they use on their own code that are also meant to be used if you're building an operator. Um, and so all a CRD does is it's, it's a short uh, definition which basically just says to Kubernetes, we have a new object type uh, that I want you to manage. And Kubernetes will, um, will put it in etcd, it will make sure that if it, if it gets this new object type, it knows how to store it, it knows what it is, it knows it's something that, that it manages. The problem with just creating a CRD though is that if you just create a CRD, what happens is uh, it, it goes in and it's managed in etcd, um, but no one uh, listens to it. Uh, no, one, no one cares if you've changed it or if you've added new ones or if you've deleted them. And so that's where our controller comes into play. And so we've written out a controller that cares about our custom resource, which in this case we've called a couch-based cluster. Um, and so as you're uh, pushing new configurations into Kubernetes, what happens is our controller is connected into Kubernetes and it listens for all these changes that are coming in uh, uh, to, the, to the configurations. And it's able to look at those, um, and it's able to look at, at what the desired state is, and then it's able to build a couch uh, or a cluster, um, cluster it all up. If you have failures, handle failures, uh, do all the types of things that you might do if you're managing a couch-based cluster. Um, yeah, and so I'm just going to jump right into you know, exactly w what these things look like, um, how you set them up, uh, and, and the various parameters that we have. Um, so the first thing um, is that... Um, so, so we don't compile this code directly into, yes. Okay. This one's actually not that important because this one you always just load in the same way to your Kubernetes cluster. You never change it. But anyways, um, we don't compile this code into Kubernetes. Um, so we need Kubernetes uh, to be able to run it. Um, and we, we need to set it up after we've set up our Kubernetes cluster. And so the way that this works is we actually, we just use a deployment, uh, which was talked about earlier and we install our controller into Kubernetes to run as a pod. That pod will connect to the Kubernetes master, uh, and then it will be able to receive all of these updates on couch-based cluster configurations. Um, and so I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to go through too much here because most of this stuff is just set up for that container. Um, but the only thing that's really interesting is that we have our Docker container, which is hosted in Docker Hub. So the only thing that we would actually give to you to set this up is this YAML file. And all you would do is you would just push it into your cluster, which I'll show you how to do in a minute. So I talked about our couch-based cluster configuration. And so, um, actually, I'm going to go to this one. So this is our full cluster configuration. Um, I'm going to load in a subset later, and I'll go through each of the various things. But it allows you to do all kinds of stuff. Um, so we can say... Uh, what version of Couchbase we want running. Um, and in the future, when we implement auto-upgrade, one thing you'll be able to do in this field is if you have Couchbase 451 running and you want to upgrade to 5.0, all you would do is you would just change this from 451 to 5.0, update your configuration, and then the Couchbase controller would automatically go around and it would start removing the old nodes and adding new nodes in um, so that you'd have zero downtime. 
Um, various other things. Anti-affinity uh, just means make sure you don't run two pods on the same node, which is really important with databases because if you have a crash, you don't want all your replicas to be located on the same machine. Um, so I mentioned, so we can set up configuration parameters. So we can say um, what all of our service quotas are for the various services that we're running into our cluster. Uh, if a node crashes, how long until we fail that node out of the cluster? We can specify all the buckets that we want to create so that as w when we push this in, we get a full cluster that's set up so that we can just point an application to it and start working. Um, we can specify uh, what all of the individual pods look like. So in this case, as Neil talked about, we have uh, multiple different services that can be run in Couchbase. And so here I'm running all of the services, um, but we could have a subset of these. Um, and in my next uh, uh, example that I show, I'll, we're actually going to have a multi-dimensional uh, scaling cluster where we have some pods that are only running the data service and other pods that are running the rest of the services. Uh, and then there's various things that you can specify too. You, you can uh, specify uh, how, how many resources the pod takes up. Um, so that uh, maybe you don't want to use your entire node to run Couchbase. You want to have uh, this, some space for other applications to run on it. Um, and, and, and various other things like this. So the example that I'm going to show you guys um, is, so we're just going to create a cluster. We're going to cre create a cluster with Couchbase 501. Uh, we have one bucket, which is named default. And then as I mentioned before, so we have this multidimensional scaling. So um, servers, so we're going to have two data nodes, and then we're going to have one node that's running index query and search. So, okay, uh, so to load this up, uh, so to load this up, all that you have to do um, is you use kubectl, uh, which is the uh, command line tool that interacts with Kubernetes. Uh, we want to create um, uh, the, the Couchbase operators. This is installing it, and then we just point to our YAML file. So this was the first YAML file that I showed you. And so installing Couchbase is as easy as running this command. Oops, not this one. And then uh, if I come to the uh, Kubernetes dashboard, you can see that the Couchbase operator is running as a deployment. And I have one pod, which is running the actual um, Couchbase operator. And so I put this in a deployment. I didn't just create a pod. I put it in a deployment. Because if this pod crashes, what will happen is the deployment will restart that pod. So if for any reason my, my operator goes away, it will automatically be restarted by Kubernetes. Whereas if I just created the pod and the node crashed that the pod was on, the pod would be gone and no one would be managing my clusters anymore. So it takes a second to come up and be ready. Um, and so now we can see that the operator is ready. And so at this point, we can now start creating Couchbase clusters. So if you've used Kubernetes before, one thing I think that's really interesting uh, is with kubectl, uh, you can do things like kubectl get pods, and it'll tell you all the pods in the cluster. So I told you guys I created a Couchbase cluster object. And so what's really nice is Couch, or Kubernetes already knows about this object. And so I haven't created any yet, but I can actually ask Kubernetes, how many Couchbase clusters do I have? Where, you know, where are they? Tell me about them. And I'll get a little bit more into this later. Um, Okay, so now I want to create the cluster. So all I have to do to do that um, is I run kubectl uh, create and then uh, the Couchbase cluster. And so again, it's just as simple as loading in one YAML file. Uh, and then you'll see here, you can start seeing the cluster coming up. So we see we have one pod already. There's going to be three in total. Um, and then I'm going to open up a port. Uh, so that I can see the UI, and you guys will be able to see this actually being built. Okay, and so you can see, so now I'm connected uh, to my cluster. And if I come to the servers page, so you can see one node here, and so shortly we should see a second one, so if I refresh this, you can see there's two here, and if I come back, so we have one node that's pending rebalance. Uh, third one will come in in a second. Okay, and then we should see the rebalance take place. And you can see two here, so we have the data service running on two of the nodes, and then full text index and query running on the other ones. Um, and then a bucket should get added here any second. 
There you go. And so just by running those two commands, you have a three-node Couchbase cluster automatically set up. Um, and then it, you know, if any of these nodes failed, uh, which, which you'll see a little bit later, um, they'll, Kubernetes will automatically handle this. It will fail out the, 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 the pod that went down. It'll add a new one back in. Okay. So one other thing. So I had um, I'd shown that uh, you can, well, so if I come back actually to this uh, git command, so you can now see my, my Couchbase cluster CB example, which was created two minutes ago. One thing that's also really nice is Kubernetes allows you to get more information about the Couchbase cluster that you're running. And so you can do this with the describe command, which you can run on any object in uh, Kubernetes. And so by doing that, we can actually see the configuration that we loaded up. Um, and then we can also see various information about the status of the cluster. So I can see the buckets that are currently available. Uh, I can see conditions, so I can see right now the cluster is balanced. Um, so that means if I have a failure that um, I don't have to worry about losing data because my data is uh, all, uh, it's all available. Um, yeah, so here I can see that all the data is available. So this, this would be false if one of my nodes was down. So that would mean that um, you need to fail over in order to make the data active again. <laughs> Uh, I can see the amount of uh, nodes that are the amount of pods that are in my cluster. Um, and then I can see all the different things that have taken uh, place in the cluster. So we created a service here for the cluster. We added three, uh, three, mem three pods. We rebalanced the cluster. We created a new bucket. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the power of operators. Um, and, and as I mentioned, there was all kinds of things that we'll be adding. So we, we have automatic failure recovery, but we're going to add support for persistent volumes, we'll add support for um, upgrades, support for automated backups and restores. Um, so you'll literally just be able to specify what your cluster should look like, load it into Kubernetes, and it will be created. Uh, any questions? How yeah. would that work with uh, bi-directional replication? Yeah, so what we're, what we're doing for that, uh, so that's another thing that we're adding for our uh, 1.0 release uh, when, when we go GA. We will open up um, ports uh, externally to Kubernetes for each node, or I'm sorry. So the pod has an IP address on the internal network, and then obviously it sits on a node. So we map ports from the node IP address um, to the internal IP address. Um, and by doing that, we're able to expose the Kubernetes cluster uh, outside to talk to wherever else. There are other things that, that you can do too. So you can actually, um, so I, I haven't personally done this, but I have an engineer on my team who set this up. You can, uh, you can set up the networking uh, in order to actually allow both Kubernetes clusters to see each other. And you can start them on different IP addresses. Um, so that's another option. Yeah. Um, Kubernetes has all kinds of networking plugins that you can use that allow you to get different behavior. So I think there's, I don't know, there's like 10 or 15 of them. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that'll be another feature that we're adding. Um, and um, you need a little bit of server support, so that'll only be supported with uh, Couchbase 5.5. should be released this summer. So does it create like a Kube service? Yeah, so I am not on the version that, um, that has the stuff that I was just talking about. But see, so you can see when we create these clusters, we create services too. Um, so normally when you set this stuff up, um, you, you have to create all these things yourself. Um, and so we, we can actually create any type of object in Kubernetes that we need for the cluster. So this CB example UI, uh, so I opened up a port before, but if I went to port, I believe this, this port 31987 on this node, um, then I would be able to access it. Uh, and then we have an internal, um, an internal, what's called a headless service, uh, which ha allows you to do service discovery. So for us, we don't want to load balance between all the Couchbase nodes. Our clients do that. And so what you can do is you can actually ask Kubernetes, um, hey, like, where is my Couchbase cluster CB example? And it'll come back and it'll say, oh, it's at these three IP addresses, or in our case, we set up DNS names. And so if you have an application, you don't even have to know where your cluster is. You just have to know what the name of it is, and it'll automatically be able to connect. Any other questions? Okay. Do you want to do the GKE? It would be easier if I... You want to plug in? Or what? No, I don't think I can plug it yeah. in. But can you move it down? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'm just going to put it on the ground. Damn. Yeah.
Not far enough. There, do this. So yeah, um, that was like a classic example of when the operator pattern is way better than using any of the built-in constructs, and like that's the, the canonical example. So, because it it used certain features of stateful set, but without actually using stateful set itself, like the headless service, for example, which does uh, DNS names for for each pod, is is kind of uh, something that we did with stateful service, but it can be pulled apart and used by an operator as well. Yeah, the general rule of thumb is you should always use something in Kubernetes unless you really can. So that's why we use services, we use persistent volumes, we use all the stuff available unless there's something that we really can. And like on the on the flip side, like we get lots of requests on, hey, we want this new feature in stateful set. If we kept adding all of them, it would become this huge bloated mess. So we want to keep it as broad as possible, but at the same time allow for extensions to make use of certain features from them. Yeah. So now I wear my Googler hat and talk more about uh, Google Kubernetes Engine. So we talked about Kubernetes. Uh, Google Kubernetes Engine is hosted Kubernetes on Google Cloud Platform. So it's, it's basically a Kubernetes cluster as a service. So all you do is um, you can single click deploy a cluster that is managed for you completely. So why is managing Kubernetes hard? There's Lots of different moving parts. There is the node OS, which is what, what operating system do I pick for my node? Um, how do we, each of them perform? How do I deal with security fixes on each of them? Like there's a new CVE that the Linux kernel has. Who, who goes and patches that and ensures that things are working? Things like that. Um, then there's like provisioning machines, the fact that you want to you know, scale up and down. If you're on the cloud especially, you want to scale your nodes up and down as well. So uh, GCP would do some of that. There's configuring networking. And like you mentioned, there are lots of networking plugins out there. There are many different ways to do it. But um, some of them are better than others. And, and as Google, we kind of understand the characteristics of each of these. So uh, that's kind of what we try to do. And this has existed for quite some time now. GKA is just uh, the, basically the easiest way to run Kubernetes. And, and all you get, like what you get is an uh, is a container cluster that's managed for you completely and an API in front of it that you can interact with um, using Kubernetes stuff. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of other things that happen which are magical in the background. The, the security backup and scaling, like I mentioned. Uh, the masters themselves are uh, managed for you. So suddenly if you go from like a five node cluster to a 500 node cluster, we take care of the master for you, scaling it in the right way and so on. There's, VM repair and upgrade some things up with the VM. Um, <clears throat> we make sure it comes back up, does the right thing. Uh, regional clusters, which is uh, more of, I want to tolerate a very easy level failures. Like, I want to be multi easy. That's what that would uh, enable. And then there's cluster order scaling and pod order scaling, where I could, pod order scale is actually interesting. It's like, uh, I could have certain constraints for when I want to scale up uh, my pods. And, and Kubernetes will, that's actually a Kubernetes feature, where it, it would scale up the number of pods for you based on certain constraints, let's say CPU or something. But what's even more interesting is how it plays with cluster auto scaling, where you could have cluster auto scaling set up so that if there are a certain number of pending pods, the cluster also scales up. So you can have a truly elastic workload that way. Um, and then there's preemptive VMs. There's TPUs, which is like super popular right now for machine learning type of workloads. And then there's like integration with logging, monitoring, and so on. I'll show you some of this stuff. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna now go to the demo of the Couchbase operator on GKE. And so this is kind of the beta feature set that uh, Couchbase is there. It, it has the declarative configuration and uh, my show this to you. There is uh, scaling up and down. There's fault tolerance, which I'll be showing you shortly. Uh, it also integrates well with like stack drivers, so you could get logs. You could set up alerts on on GCP. You know, if, if certain conditions are hit n number of times, then alert and so on. I, I think Couchbase has some functionality around this as well, but this is more like uh, general purpose for all applications. So you could have alerts that work across many different applications. Uh, and then future work, like uh, mentioned, there's going to be persistent volumes. There's going to be RBAC. 
which is role-based access control, which is a, a way to sort of constrain the number of things an operator can do. It's, it's kind of best practice for an operator to just ask for permissions that it absolutely needs so that it, it, it is, isn't, um, you know, it doesn't have the powers to do other things to your cluster. So RBAC is kind of the mechanism that we use to ensure that everything has just the adequate amount of So that's something that, yeah. Were you, were you saying beta there? That beta is to the couch based operator, not change. Yes, yes. This is uh, all of this refers to the coach based operator. GKE is not beta. <laughs> yeah. How does uh, this compare to AWS? EKS. Yeah, Obviously, you don't have the TPU, so it's Elastic Kubernetes service. Right, right. Yeah. There has been other services yeah. in the last uh, event. So, how does those two compare? So, obviously, here you get access to TPUs, which you don't get on Amazon, but all the other stuff. How those, the previous slide, how those two slides, let's say, so what's the, what's the advantage of using EKS versus, let's say, G E? <laughs> BKS hasn't gone GA yet, so I don't know if it's a fair comparison at this point. But uh, from, so I, I can say this generally. As Kubernetes was being built, we kind of understood exactly how each of these components behave, how masters scale. We've run into a lot of those production issues and solved them that are going to be, uh, you know, that are going to be solved in the future on, on other platforms. So. I, my answer to that is there may be a time at which they kind of approach parity, but by that time, there'll be other things on, on GKE. So, okay. so as of now, I don't know of, uh, like a lot of these features are pretty hard to build, and I don't know that EKS would be able to solve them right out of the gate. I was curious. That was just elephant to you. that's so fair. Um, so, we're going to the demo. So, set, setting up a cluster is something. Uh, this is the Google Cloud Console UI. And uh, I've actually just set up a cluster because it, was, it takes like a minute, but I don't want to spend time on that. But I'll just show you how easy it is. So, even if I were to use the UI, then it would be like a couple of steps when I select. Sorry. Sure. So it's like I, I select what node image I want. Uh, cost, for example, is, is Google's own um, image. It's maintained and patched by the um, internal teams. So it's like all security fixes and everything going super good. And, and so is Ubuntu, actually. It's also fully supported. Then, uh, yeah, node upgrades and node repairs. And you, you can basically set it up and have you know, give it how many ever CPUs per node that you need. Uh, right. And alternately, and this is like a, a walkthrough that we set up with uh, Couchbase. And this one kind of describes the, the way to do it using the command line, the G Cloud command line. So it, it kind of has pretty much the same thing. You're just picking a machine type, saying in a particular zone, go and turn up a cluster. So I, I turned up a cluster already. So I'm just going to. Is this big enough? So I now have a cluster that is, uh, so my cube control is uh, ready to speak with my cluster, which I've set up, which is called Mike. Um, I'll watch for pause, so. Convenient, and we can see when something comes up. So, so I have the files that uh, Mike was showing you. The, the operator itself, the secret, which contains like authentication credentials for the Couchbase cluster and the, and the Couchbase cluster that we'll be creating, which is uh, the CRD sort of. I mean, it's, it's using the Couchbase CRD to create a new Couchbase. Right. So I'll just stand up the operator first. Yeah, and, and all of these steps are also on the, the walkthrough as well. Yeah, and 
Secret, the secret introduction. So, uh, it, it's just basic tutorial and children encoded administrator password. Yeah. Uh, secrets do get encrypted, so they end up in etcd, but uh, the encryption turned on, so everything. So, secrets in etcd. So I have just the default config. There's uh, three servers, and each of them will be running all four servers. And uh, I have auto failover set to 30 seconds. So the timeout for auto failover. Okay. So I set that to five seconds, and uh, I just apply the config again, and it should have been configured. Changed itself right now. So now let's uh, go forward. So this is setting up port forwarding from my laptop on port 8091 into the first pod. Yeah, so you can see everything is up at this point. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, one of the <coughs> scenarios we want to test is let's kill a pod. Because this is it could happen during scheduled maintenance, it could happen entirely at random because something went wrong in the cluster. You want your applications to be resilient. So you can see it's it's terminating right now. And it's gone. So on, on this screen, you should be able to see that uh, the server was automatically failed over. Let's check the settings on auto failover. The timeout is five seconds as we set it. So you should see. <coughs> so, what has happened is it, um, so Coachbase has detected that the loop of the node is down. So, it has triggered the auto failover. So, you can start. Um, so, when I say auto failover, what happens is the replicas on the other servers for the nodes will basically be activated they take the traffic right? so there's no downtime um, and then you'll see that the, the operator saw that the one of the node is down so it brought a new pod instead of the old one and then we kicked off the uh, uh, minus one. so the whole operation is completely out of yep. and you can see the rebalance is completed so what happened was it, it got a whole new pod you remember it was 002 here, that one's gone, and uh, it's been paid over to this. Um, um, additionally, yes, yeah, I also wanted to show scale up, uh, scale down. So there's no downtime, but there was this timeout, right? Like, there's no timeout is, like, uh, is a constraint we need to, um, so we want to make sure there is a, there's no false positive. We take five seconds to make sure that there is uh, the node is actually down, and then do it again. But then it is. Yeah. So we do have a uh, so in case of when the node is down, we have a read uh, replica read. So in case you want to have uh, so your client wants to read from the replicas, we do have that. But the writes will be down for that. So what kind of acknowledgement do you have for writes? So come again. So we do have observed, like for example, if you want to make sure that your uh, when you write, 
it has to be durable. In the sense, like uh, I want to make sure that the data get persisted or replicated. To. We have the APIs for that. It's configured. So it's per key basis you can configure and say, I want to make sure this particular write is persisted to the disk and then give the acknowledgement. Or I want to make sure that this data is not only persisted to the disk but also replicated to the other node and then send me acknowledgement. So in an availability acknowledgement, then, and then, uh, as you yeah, in that case, yes, seconds. correct, exactly. Just a quick question, not, not very relevant to this, but you mentioned that the secret gets encrypted, right? Mm -hmm. Is it getting encrypted or is it getting cached? No, it is, uh, secrets are encrypted. So where do you store the keys? Like, how do you encrypt it? Like, what are the keys? Where do you store the keys? Um, yeah, secret share on the details. Um, They're encrypted. It has to, yeah, all, like, every configuration piece of is encrypted before it goes into SCP. But the how do you decrypt it? What do you so I think the API server has access to those keys. And uh, usually you don't think they could be just over encrypted and compared to yeah, yeah, that's right. No, that, that would be hashing, but you still need access to the plain text secret within the application. Typically, applications are like pods would mount a secret and make them available as like a file or something. So in that case, you, you still want your unencrypted uh, thing because that's that's probably configured. In this case, you had admin and password. You, you want that to be surfaced to the application in the end. So it cannot be hashing. But exactly where the encryption keys get stored, I'm not super sure of that. But I would assume it's on the API server side because that is a component that needs to know when it's mounting those things into the. So, um, was there any other question? Yeah. Uh, what should the read isolation level um, when you have to specify the write to disk versus write to disk and wrap what that yeah. is it shift from read committed, uh, repeatable read to just a read committed status so that you know that it's arrived at the other side and now you have a replica? So, so in general, the couch space is um, strongly consistent. Right? Mm -hmm. So we read and write to the, the active partition itself. There's active partitions like we have as we work as, right? So where your, uh, when you write, read or write, it goes to the, the active partitions where the actual document is there and the, the, uh, the active partition, uh, the vbucket. So let's say if my, this uh, node is down, the, uh, all the vbuckets in this node are active vbuckets are down now, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, like uh, the replicas on the other nodes, so if you, uh, we have a read API where like in this case, you can say, uh, I want to read from the replicas, right? So which is, it, uh, there's no guarantee that it's consistent because like, there might be some in-flight data, right? Mm -hmm. So those, those are the cases, right? But then the, uh, if you don't want the read unavailability, then you can still use the read read API. Then in five seconds, the failover happens, and then the act replicas will get promoted. So then, then you can read and write to the replica part. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, if, if I want to, if my application has a dependency on capture based server, is there a way to specify in the config, like don't start my web server or whatever the thing is until until the couch based service? It's kind of running, or do I just kind of retry until that service is microservice architecture would dictate that each okay. of those should be able to part, like tolerate partial failures. In which case, you would want it to retry and check for availability <coughs> on the code base. Right? So that's the ideal way to architect it. But uh, there is mechanisms that can give you strict ordering, like uh, in Kubernetes, there's init containers, which kind of say a certain thing will run before a certain other thing. Okay. Uh, I, I guess you could check in your init container for availability and then do something smart. So that, that's one way to customize that behavior. But I think the retry loop for, hey, is this available, is probably the better way to do it. It's a lot of fun too. Um, there, a lot of people, when they deploy applications that have multiple things, they use help, uh, which is popular. And I, I haven't used it before, but it may have that type of feature where you could say, deploy this, wait, you know, do right. something else. Okay. Uh, um, deployment tools could uh, yeah, give you some of that, but again, like when a partial failure does occur, you're going to have to deal with that case anyway. One of those. Uh, okay.
I'm gonna scale up everything up all together. So I'm gonna make um, five replicas of everything. And then <clears throat> yep. So this should uh, take effect shortly. In in the meantime, show you some of the stuff that's happening on the GKE side, which you could actually use for your logging and monitor. So there's stack driver which we use for logging, and inside of this, like. So inside of my cluster, if I'm looking at events in the default namespace, then I, I will actually see stuff that the operator is publishing. So for example, these messages, CB example zero, um, some sort of event that it's logging. This is all available to me in the logs. And what I could do with it is like create, for example, create like a metric with it and have alerting on it. So this is all JSON, so I could be like on the field text payload, extract a certain regular expression, and if something happens, then trigger an event. So that's something that we do from the GKE logging side. Jump back to, okay. Wait. Does this allow for, let's say, a money like a week or something, what's OSS to alert the service discovery to start looking for something in place that's gone down? Or to wait, pause, you know, if a failure, uh, the service is unavailable until the new notes come back. So, can you clarify which uh, thing error, to react? What, what yeah, is it? Yeah, error, errors occur, brings down the entire cluster. We, we lose availability. Um, so, on, on that, from there, broadcast out to something like a URG service discovery so you can say, hey, this is offline for right now, ignore this until it comes back online, and then alert it that, hey, I'm available. A push notification. Um, I think yes. Like with Stack Driver, you could do arbitrarily complex things and have push or whatever associated with it. You could run like a Docker container which does something. Yeah, essentially, yeah. and it notifies essentially a push notification. Is that reliable? Like when I with an acceptable latency. Um, uh, I don't know if people that have done that to just call out. Yeah. Typically, like um. You can create dashboards and get a bunch of monitoring stuff here itself. So it's atypical for people to want to. Okay, so it's more analytical than. Yes. Oh. Um, so, yeah, in, in the meantime, as I was speaking, the cluster scaled up to five replicas at this point. And, uh, yeah. So, and, and rebalancing happened as well. Yeah. It was. So, it's like, again, I think one of the functionality is like, um, so you basically change the configuration. So you can uh, dynamically scale your cluster, like scale up, expand, or scale down. So uh, all you need to do is like push the changes through the uh, the configuration. It automatically triggers the rebalance and expands the cluster, right? So that's the yeah. feature. And like in general, like in DevOps workflows, this is pretty common for you to have one source of truth. This, uh, you know, maybe it's checked into Git or somewhere, and you push changes to it. It Spinnaker or some other CI/CD tool yeah. picks it up. Uh, you know, puts it through some smoke tests and then changes, updates your cluster. So that way, you always have a versioned copy of, you know exactly what's running out there, and rolling back and rolling forward is fairly easy. So the kind of declarative <coughs> specification of Couchbase here lets us accomplish this. Right. So in, I think maybe in the demo we can show that, but there's one operator which is running, and you can create uh, as many clusters as you want, right? So all, the, all you need to do as a, as, uh, as a CRE for this project is a, you can define the configuration uh, for your Couchbase cluster, and then you can define like multiple Couchbase clusters, uh, push it through the operator, and the operator makes sure that the cluster is deployed, and if you make any ch changes to the settings, it makes sure that it applies those settings. So this is basically what you were saying. Which is, yeah. We have one such cluster, and that is uh, here, and you could create as many arbitrary clusters as you want, and right. then set up replication across them, and then use that. Any, any other questions? No questions. Okay. You have any more slides to show? Or? Yeah. Um, cool. I think that's all we had. Uh, uh, can we see the scale down? Scale down? Yeah, sure.
So while he's looking, one thing I'll just add, if you've never used Kubernetes before, the easiest way to get started really quick is to download Minikube. If you have a Mac, it's as easy as typing in brew cask and install Minikube. And then you have a one node cluster automatically set up for you. And it's easy to use. And then when you want to go into production or, or you want to have a bigger cluster because you can't run that many on a single node, GKE is great for that. So. And we have instructions for uh, installing to, how to install Minikube and get started in our documentation. Is it? Okay, so yeah, so he made a change. Uh, he scaled down, um, so it automatically triggered the rebalance, basically removing those three nodes, and it will uh, go back. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have, uh, so if you go uh, go to the coachbase.com, I think uh, so. There is a blog which I published on the beta announcement. It has links to the documentation and stuff. Uh, we are we are trying to put a beta refresh, which is like um, we are adding some new features. Uh, it's coming in end of this month. So that will include some CRD validation. If, you, if I make a make, uh, mistake in, uh, in settings, it will validate before it push to the to the uh, deployment. So those are the changes. It's not remote one. Okay. I think it's it's doing it uh, one by one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, again. Uh, oh yeah, Eric. Yeah, this is a dumb question. The, what's on? Are there concerns about where odd is being created? Like, what's the um, yeah. Is that able to be defined somewhere? Yeah. Like, I want to put odd on somewhere that has the type of thing. Yes. Or, so, one thing that hasn't been discussed, which is actually a really important Kubernetes concept, is the concept of labels. And you can put labels on anything. You put them on nodes, you put them on, we put them on pods. They're used everywhere. They're used. To select for services, so you can say, you tell a service I want you to uh, load balance between all pods. And so what you do is you put a label on the node, and then you put a label in our configuration. You say only put it on nodes that have this. So if I had uh, in my CRD, I say like I I want this pod to have four gigahertz of, but you specify a label somewhere. It's like I want four gigahertz on this yeah. type of. Uh, yeah. So he mentioned the the TPUs, right? You're you're talking about resource limits, right? Like if I want to shape the pod in a particular way. Yeah. So oh, the, so. I think uh, when Michael was showing the configuration file with CID file. Yeah. The bottom there was a section where you can, you can define the pod and what configuration you want, right? What resource yeah. you want all of. It. So you can define that in the CID itself. Yeah. But you could also say only put it on a certain node. So like yes, he, he was talking about TPUs, right? Yeah. So if this was not couch based, it was something else. You're like it needs to have a TPU. <laughs> You don't want it to be scheduled on, on something with a normal CPU. So you may have a label that is um, CPU type equals TPU. Mm -hmm. And you put that as a node selector, and then that will only have, it'll only allow pods to be scheduled. The other thing that you can do is you can say, uh, when this pod gets created, it should have uh, three CPUs, it should have 20 terabytes, 20 gigabytes of memory, it should have 100 gigabytes of storage. You can specify that also. But that just reserves the limits wherever it gets placed. Yeah, so like if I wanted to get like weird though, you have like you would define that with a label and then Kubernetes would put the label in yeah. CRD. Uh, yeah, you'd put the label in the definite your cluster definite. Okay. Um, sorry, I missed the last part, but I'm saying uh, yeah, you could specify a resource requests and limits in Kubernetes and what that means is what that means is you could say I want at least this base amount and I can burst up to this higher amount. You could have a range there. You don't even have to constrain yourself to I want exactly five you could be like I want three up front but give me as much as there is on a particular so that's that's one way to make sure that you end up on the right note. The other way of course is labels and user notes <coughs> or something like that to ensure that your pod is targeted to a particular node that has the feature that you're looking at. Maybe a special hardware device, maybe a special kind of disk. Yeah. And we support all those things in the Couchbase operators. All right. I guess I have one last question, sure. just minor one. Um, 
I have my cluster, it's running, it's all happy. I'm yep. writing some data into it. A node goes down before the replica sets get passed around, before that piece of data gets around. Um, normally, in a normal couch-based instance, I bring the node back up to journal replay, and bam, I get my data back, right? How, how does that happen if it spins up a brand new one without you know, any recollection of what was in memory? Or on that individual disk? Yeah. So uh, this is where persistent volumes come into play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so they're basically network-attached volumes. There's probably 30 different types to choose from. Uh, yeah, you, so that, that's part of the, one of the great things about stateful sets. Stateful sets, uh, if it goes down and comes back up, it will have the same IP address and DNS, right? Both? Yeah. And then it will, uh, it wouldn't have just, DNS. Again, it's just, just DNS. Just DNS. So have the same DNS name, and then it will have the persistent volume plugged back in. So if you have a file server, that's stateless, their stateful set is great for that. Uh, and so we will do the same thing. Right, if it comes back up, it'll know where it was, yeah. Yeah. three files. And that, that uh, support for the persistent volume is not in the beta, but it will be the friends of worrying about GA. Sorry, I'm asking a bunch of 1.0 questions. <laughs> no, the girls, that's okay. <laughs> those are some good questions. What's the timeline for 1.0? Uh, summer, um, so it's like in, there should be planned for July, August time frame. Okay. Maybe we should name with that or hard break hey, down with these <laughs> But um, so I would encourage, obviously, um, so uh, we are we are running the beta program. So I know you guys can participate in the beta program. Uh, feedbacks are almost welcome. So we have a forum, uh, forum.cosspace.com. So we have a category called communities. You can post any questions. So we'll be happy to answer. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.